Hello, hello, and welcome to Quackalob, and today we're going to be doing a Kickstarter-sponsored preview of Scarface 1920, published by Red Zen Games, in partnership with Big Kid Creative, and designed by Tori Serendassen Firm and Daniel Simmon. This is going to be what I would call a hybrid board game. What does that necessarily mean? Well, it kind of implies that it is a mishmash of a ton of different genres and mechanics that don't seem to kind of work together but when you put them together in an intelligent way it creates something very different this game is going to be combining deck building area control victory points and also hand management and tableau building what you're doing here is that you will be building an empire slowly but surely trying to expand as fast as possible before the federal government comes in and kind of shuts everything down. And to give you a little bit more context as to what you're exactly doing and who you are in this game, I'm gonna let the narration do its job. The wind was brushing against his face. The noise of the engine was giving him a certain peace of mind. He was at ease for the first time in many years, and he suspected he would be able to enjoy this anytime soon. Wind. That's what they told him he would get in Chicago when he arrived from New York. But Alphonse Gabriel Capone, the son of a Barbie and a seamstress, both born in Italy, knew for a fact that the wind was going to be the least of his worries. He had a ride with prohibition just around the corner. A law that was a blessing to many and a curse to some, and a chance to amass wealth and power to a few. That was all well and good, but he wanted more, see? He wanted to have the city at his feet, he wanted to go down in history. But no kid ever dreams of becoming a gangster. Not even him, as much as he had been raised among Brooklyn streets gangs. Throughout those years, he had learned to move in the shadows, to cultivate the art of intimidation, to respect the hierarchy, and to understand the inner workings of a gang. And therefore, he knew exactly, perfectly, well what he had to rule on every corner of the underworld, so that little by little, bullet by bullet, he could forge a criminal empire. When Al Capone stepped down the car, a flurry of journalists was waiting for him. He wasn't at odds with fame. As a matter of fact, he enjoyed the flashes of camera, even if that meant he had to hide his wound. A wound that had earned him the nickname he loathed. Scarface. So even though if that narration sounded like you're only going to be Al Capone, that's not necessarily true. I was selective in what I was reading. The reality is that you're going to be able to choose out of four major crime families of Chicago in the 1920s. And as an example, here we have Stephanie St. Clair from the Black Wolves Gang. And so all of these bosses are going to come together and fight it out in Chicago to see ultimately who has the best possible empire, the person or the family that is able to accumulate the most amount of money by the end of the game when the federal government comes in and basically shuts everything down will be named the best crime family. And let me be explicitly clear from this point onwards. This is a huge game in its scope and I will not be able to cover every single nuance and cavity that this game has to offer to you. With that said, I wanna make sure that you have a good understanding of what you could potentially be backing when you go into the Kickstarter to check out with much more detail what this is promising. And so with that, let me try my best to break down the three major elements that this game is. The deck building, the worker placement, and also the area control that this game is trying to do. So first of all, this game is going to work similarly to both Clank and also Everdell in a lot of ways. The deck building in this game is a little bit about finding efficiency and finding strategies, but at the same time trying to stretch out your turns as much as possible so that you can get better and better results and kind of push out your end of turn because every time that somebody ends or is unable to continue taking turns, they will push time forward, eventually at basically making a raid happen. And when raids happen, that's not very good. Basically, everybody has to pay money in order to keep the police off of them and potentially even remove thugs from the board. But either way, that is one of the things that we won't be touching about. Point is that your workers 
and your cards work in unison together to stretch out your turns and give you stronger and stronger opportunities to make more money, aka victory points. So let's talk a little bit about the deck building and what makes deck building in this game particularly unique. And that I will show you through your base cards and some of the cards that we have here on our marketplace. So every card in your deck is basically called an associate and also your boss card. These associates have three major things that you always want to keep pay attention to. You're going to have the basic resources that they generate, which you'll be able to spend in order to bolster your worker placement actions, the icon in the upper right hand corner that essentially describes their, uh, their, spe their specialty, and then finally the skill that each card has. This is a massive deck and it is composed of completely unique cards both in its artwork and also its skills. And here's where things get weird. Skills in this game are kind of be your extra, your extra. Yes, they generate resources, but the skills is really what makes the cards particularly special. First of all, some skills are not gonna have any type of requirement, but other skills are going to require another person of a particular specialty to be played out in front of you. Every turn, you're basically going to lay out your hand of cards in front of you, and depending on who is there, that is what you'll be able to do. You choose which cards you want to play, but mostly you're gonna wanna play as much as you can to capitalize every turn. So, for example, the lieutenant here from the Chicago outfit can retrieve one thug or worker from a district or a deal. However, the Sicilian hitman, even though he does have a standard ability or skill, he also has this. If you have another uh, hit symbol or a lips symbol, if you're going to be able to seize a, if you're going to seize a neighborhood, spend one gun and one muscle if you have a card next to it. In other words, these skills, depending on how you build your deck, are going to play off of each other. You are trying to build synergy within your empire, which is what makes the deck building in this particular game really comprehensive and requires a lot of forethought as you're moving forward in the game so that you know that you are getting the right cards at the right time. And speaking of things that are going to be very important, you're going to have your muscle and your influence Muscle and influence is going to essentially be the currency, similar to how Clank has the coins that you generate every time you play cards, and you're able to use those cards to buy better cards. Well, in this game, you're able to just make your worker placement action stronger. Muscle is usually going to be things like moving people out of certain territories, using muscle to try and get your way for certain things, and influence is going to be used for much more subtle activities like maybe convincing new associates to join your crew, speaking to the police and bribing them, etc., etc. Every card that you play is always going to have some type of influence and muscle gain, and that has to be balanced in conjunction with everything else. So that is how deck building works. Now let's start jumping into worker placement. This game is, as I said, a worker placement game mainly with an addition of area control there. Worker placement is going to be divided into eight major actions, and those actions are pretty straightforward. I'm not necessarily gonna read them all, but Every worker that you have is represented by a thug, a criminal that you are building step by step in your empire. When you get new workers into your game, you're going to bring them into the recruit space and through training and perseverance, you're going to make them ready to come out into the world once they reach your headquarters. So this in itself is almost like a small engine that you're trying to build. How often do you move your workers forward in order to prepare them to be used later on your turn? Remember when I said that you're trying to stretch out your turns? This is where we start seeing the combination and how intrinsic it is to have good card play and also have a good pool of workers available. Cards are going to allow to make your workers stronger, while workers are going to allow you to actually take actions and stretch out your turn as much as possible. But when you have workers available in your headquarters, you're gonna be able to send them to multiple locations. Those locations are usually going to be neighborhoods in order to get victory points, dealers that are going to generate the resources that you need in order to actually acquire 
those goods or that money from the neighborhoods and also other major loca locations like the underworld, the authorities, the prison that give you another complete and totally different types of set of actions that allow you to do things like evolve your gang, get new crew members into your into your posse, uh, potentially gain control of other areas, etc, etc. All of these things start working in unison so that you build your empire slowly but surely. And speaking of building, area control. The way that area control works in this game is almost like a worker placement spot. Um, one of the possible actions that you can take is that you can take one of your thugs and send them into a neighborhood. Every time that you do that, remember when I said that the cards and the workers work together? You're going to compare strength. Strength here in this game is going to be determined by whoever controls the area and the different types of assets and pieces that they have there. Basically imagine that each one of those has a certain value. When you send workers to a particular location, that worker counts as one strength. However, every card in your hand that generated muscle or strength will be able to be played here. So if you have a card or a hand of cards that just has amazing muscle and you haven't gotten that that entire game, maybe this is the one moment that you should kind of really push out um, Stephanie from having control of that particular neighborhood. And in addition to that, you're also going to be able to take workers from a location and kind of invade another one. You'll notice that you have both thugs and cars. Again, cars and, and these small buildings represent kind of assets that help and bolster your empire as you keep moving forward. There's a lot of other things to contend here in the area control. You're gonna have those neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods are the only way that you get the victory points or one of the main ways you get victory points. You're able to evolve those neighborhoods little by little. In addition to that, you're also gonna have police officers that are gonna be roaming the streets and those police officers are actually controlled by other players on the table. There's a lot happening both in your deck building, in the way that you're placing your workers out in order to capitalize on their actions, and also in the area control aspect. But even though I've already mentioned a lot of elements that we've seen, I want to try and highlight a few things that I think are particularly special about Scarface 1920. One of the things that I find particularly engaging about this game is that everything that you're doing is basically building on top of itself. The deck of cards that you're building feels stronger and stronger, and it feels kind of like you're actually building a portfolio of horrible and very cunning criminals. In Dealers that we didn't even talk about is kind of a resource management section where you're slowly creating new spots where you're going to be able to send your workers to to try and get more and more goods. And remember, those goods is what we use to get money. And not just that, but you're also able to evolve and upgrade your gang. One of the multiple actions that you're able to take is upgrade your gang where you take one cube from a boss track and you're basically slotted into different types of skill sets that give you more and more things like maybe upping your hand size, giving you some defense when the federal uh, government comes in, uh, dealing with more suppliers, etc., etc. Everything in this game is built so that you feel like an actual crime boss by the end of the game. So one, another thing that is particularly interesting here, and I feel that this is something or inspired by Architects of the West Kingdom, is that some of your thugs can be sent to prison. And so you have to go and collect those thugs from prison. There's different sections and some of the cleanup phases allow you to basically bring those back, but you have the option of picking them up earlier, which remember again, it is major that you always have access to your workers. So if they start going to prison, you start having limited availability, you're not gonna want that to happen. And the last thing I'll mention about this game is the ridiculous amount of flexibility that you're going to have in how you build your deck and the types of dealers that you're going to have access to and the types of resources and how they are generated. Also the types of jobs that you have available and the types of situations that happen throughout the game, things that we didn't even talk about. There are certain uh, event moments. Every time that a raid happens, which is essentially when a round ends, something is gonna happen and players are gonna have to be paying different types of costs as the game keeps moving forward. There's a lot here to explore and it actually feels like a thriving and pretty menacing city to explore. 
Now, there, uh, like with any game, there's always things that I want to mention that might not be right for uh, for some players. And so Scarface 1920, of course, is going to have some of those as well. One of the things that Scarface does that is actually quite unique is that miscalculation could be dire for you in this game. What do I mean by that? Well, we talked about the multiple actions that you can take. Well, sometimes, depending on how things pan out, you're not going to be able to take any of those actions. And so the eighth action, the most horrible of the actions, is if at any time you cannot take any of the seven actions, for every card in your plan, you're going to have to remove one thug from the board. But that thug is not going to go back into your headquarters or even the recruits. It's going to go back into the box. You will permanently lose a worker for the rest of the game if you do not plan ahead. And for people that struggle with forethought and trying to think of multiple things at the same time, that can definitely become an issue. And speaking of multiple things happening at the same time, this is a machine. There are multiple cogs turning at every point. You have your deck, you have your tableau, you have the different types of resources and management and the economy that you have to deal with. You have the area control, you have the conditions of the federal when the raids happen, you have a timer, you have stretching out your turns. This is a complex game. If you are not looking for a deck builder worker placement games that is probably a lot higher than what we've seen so far, then maybe this is something that you're going to want to really consider and maybe even read the rule book before actually jumping in. With that being said, I believe that once you actually table this, it'll become a lot easier. But even, the, even then, there's just a lot of things to keep up in your gray matter as you move forward here. I, I think that this next one is, you know, a, a smaller, a smaller point, but the theme may be problematic for some people. You know, we're, we're dealing with crime, we're dealing with really nasty things. There is um, in, in insinuation of different types of activities that are probably not very, you know, positive. So if that is an issue for you, then this game is definitely not gonna sugarcoat it. It's all very abstract in the way that it's presented, but of course you can kind of tell what the undertones are here, right? And the last thing I'll mention is that because this is a hybrid game that is combining area control and worker placement, that creates a little bit of a dichotomy. Worker placement games are synonymous with being almost sometimes, not always, multiplayer solitaire, right? You, you're doing things and nobody's gonna be able to affect those plans. You're kind of safe in how you progress through your game. However, because this is an area control game, you have to expect and you have to understand that people are gonna get in your way in some shape or form. You're all competing over the same type of resources. You're all competing over the same types of districts and neighborhoods. And you're gonna have to expect that people are going to be playing cards. They're going to be moving police officers to certain locations to try and impair you and make it a little bit harder for you to maybe make some money or take control of certain key districts. And that's just some, something that is part and baked into this experience. We're talking about crime lords. Of course, there's going to be some level of backstabbery or just very mean actions that are going to be able to do to each other. With that said, none of these actions feel like you're, you know, getting hammered for the entirety of the game or anything like that. They're just minor setbacks that you always have to plan around for. And that, everybody, is a preview of Scarface 1920. In terms of final thoughts or what I've seen so far on this game, I got to say that I am very impressed. I didn't mention this at the beginning of the video because I don't think you can even tell, but this is a prototype copy of Scarface 1920 and the team has put so much love and attention into every single aspect of this. The miniatures are great. The artwork is absolutely ridiculous. You've seen that every card has unique artwork and unique and, and unique abilities. There is a lot of attention to detail here that gives me a lot of confidence. In addition to that, all the, the way that each of the elements of this hybrid are kind of working together seem to have been pairing off really well. Naturally, I don't have the too much experience with the game yet, but from what I've seen so far, I am basically ecstatic of how everything essentially plays out. And as I kind of alluded to before, I am seeing influence, influences here of Everdell, of Alexander Pfister, of Architects of the West Kingdom, and, and even Clank. Basically almost all the games that I have in my top 10 or top 20, this game is doing something through the combination of all these mechanics that I have not yet seen before, especially in such an audacious design. 
and I cannot wait to see how this pans out and keeps and keeps evolving through this Kickstarter. And with that, thank you so very much for joining us on this Kickstarter preview. I know that was a lot, but hey, this is a huge game and I wanna make sure that you understood what you were getting yourself into. If you like what we're doing here in Quackalope, please be sure to leave a comment down below with your thoughts on Scarface 1920. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell to get notifications on the next videos that we do. But regardless of what you do, remember to do the important thing and try and take advantage of Prohibition. We'll see you guys next time.